All right, everybody, let's open up to John chapter 4, verse number 34. John 4, 34. So we kind of ended last week right in the middle of it, uh, kind of right in the middle of the ending of this little section. Jesus has been in Samaria, and he's been talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, uh, and he impressed her, for lack of a better word, with things he knew about her that uh, a stranger certainly should not have been able to know, and the, the spe specifics of the details, the amount that he knew about her was enough to make her realize this person is a prophet, and it leads to a discussion where she comes to realize this is not just a prophet, this is the prophet, this is the Messiah, this is the one that not just the Jews, but the Samaritans too have been waiting on that was prophesied and spoken of by Moses and others. Uh, and so they have this conversation that ends with her running back toward the city to go tell everybody that she can find and, and hear uh, that she's found the Messiah. And she's, she kind of hedges her bets a little bit. She says, is this not the Messiah? Kind of leaves it an opening to question, maybe just to spark the curiosity of everyone else. So everyone else starts huddling up and gathering to, en masse, leave town to head down to where the well is, just outside of the city, to go see Jesus for themselves. Meanwhile, Jesus is talking to his disciples who had been in the city and who came out of the city first and saw him talking with a Samaritan woman, and they're taking a back five because we're not supposed to do that. I mean, there's no law, but that's just, you know, good Jewish manners is you don't talk to the dirty people, and the Samaritans are dirty people. That's just the way they looked at things. So here is their master talking to this person they would never be caught dead talking to. So they question, talk about that. She's gone. They go to the Lord. And they went into the city to get food. They come back and they talk to the Lord. And they say, Lord, you need to eat. And he says, I'm not hungry. Which just blows their minds and, and no doubt you know confuses them because they thought, well, you sent us into this city, this nasty city with these nasty people. We don't want to go here. We don't want to shop here. But you sent us in there for food and you say you're not hungry. And he says, I have a different kind of food, John 4, 34. My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Obviously, the Lord has a belly. The Lord needs food. He does require sustenance. But he is saying, I, he's saying I have something bigger in mind. I, I have a bigger picture that I, that I think about. I have a bigger meal, if you will, in a spiritual kind that I adhere to. Uh, and he's, just, he's using this as an opportunity to get his disciples who would never have volunteered to go through Samaria from Judea to Galilee. They would have taken the traditional long way around. He's trying to get them to see that if you follow the, the, the traditional playbook, that if you do things the way they've always been done, if you're not willing to step out there and upset the apple cart and do something unexpected, do something unorthodox, then you will miss out on souls by the countless. Because he talked to one person and she went and talked to countless people, and now countless people are coming to hear from Jesus uh, themselves, who would never have heard from Jesus if Jesus did not take the initiative to go into this place where all the other Jews, by tradition, stayed away from, um, almost to the point of it being just taboo. So G Jesus, the disciples are learning that Jesus does not think the way they think. And if they want to keep up, they're going to change the way they think too. That's just kind of what's happening here. So um, we, we, le we left off, I think, here in verse 35 with um, Gary Rhodes painting us a beautiful little word picture at the end of the last week's class. Um, but uh, we'll read the verse, then we'll go back to that and then continue. Jesus continues, he says, Don't say there are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look to the fields, for they are white already to harvest. White to harvest, you can see just by the way um, the, the grain looks, by the way the sun glistens on it, by the way the colors of it change, you can tell a, a, a well-established um, uh, well farmer can tell it is harvest time, or it is almost harvest time, just by the way his crop looks. So Jesus says, I need you to see beyond the wheat. I want you to see beyond the material. I want you to see beyond the physical. This this beautiful ties in with what he just got through saying. You know, there's something more than just filling your belly. Think beyond physical food. Well, where does that food come from? Where does the bread they went to buy come from? From the fields that will soon be cut down and harvested to make grain to make bread. So see beyond that. See to the spiritual food. See to the spiritual harvest that is there to be reaped. And then, as, as I said, um, Gary painted that word picture of how in between the well and the city is the field. And so you imagine Jesus and directing his disciples' attention to the city where the people are, but the people have left the city and they're coming toward Jesus, which means they're passing through that field. And so you're looking at these, these stalks of wheat 
and they're, they're swaying, and they're, they're rustling, and they're billowing through the movement of the people walking through them to get to him, and you just see heads and shoulders coming this way, and Jesus is looking at them. He's talking about a harvest, and he's talking about reaping and sowing, and the disciples are looking at wheat, and Jesus says, look beyond the wheat. Do you see all the people? The fields are ready for you to harvest them. This is fertile ground, in other words, and all the other Jews before me have been going around it, have been missing out on this bounty because they thought, ooh, they're icky Samaritans. But here we are, and look, here they come. Jesus continues, verse 36. He that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal. We're not talking about you work on a farm, and so you do the farm work, and you harvest the grain, and you get your reward for how much you harvest and so forth. No, we're talking about souls, spiritual harvest. So you will gather fruit, you will reap your bounty unto eternal life. So that both he that sows and he that reaps, they rejoice together because they're not always the same person. Someone is going out there and scattering the seed and then get carrying on. And then someone else is coming up behind them after the seed has grown and they are reaping the harvest. They didn't scatter a single seed. They didn't do any of that work. They did a different work. But together, they will enjoy the feast. Together, they will break bread and share a fellowship meal. Together, they will enjoy the combined spoils of their mutual work. And herein is the saying true, verse 37. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. I'm sending you to reap. I'm going to be sending you out, disciples, out into places where the groundwork has already been laid, where the seed has already been scattered. You didn't scatter it. Someone else did it. I'm sending you out there to reap where someone else has sown. That doesn't make you thieves. That doesn't make you... Um, um, vagabonds just mooching off of other people's work. No, you're doing your own work. They did their work. Now you're doing yours, and together we will all enjoy. You could tie this back, if you wanted to, to John the Baptizer. He has been doing his work before Jesus ever came onto the scene. He was alive and, and living, but he wasn't, his ministry hadn't begun yet. By the time John's has already started. And so John has been planting that metaphorical seed. He's been preparing, his, as his mission was as a prophet, preparing people for the coming Messiah. Now he has come. And he has his own disciples, and, and he is sending his disciples out, Jesus is, his disciples out, to these places where John has prepared the hearts of the people to receive the message. But John is not jealous, and John is not thinking, hey, that's my work, I should get the credit for that. John knows his role. His role is to be the, the ground layer, to prepare the way of the Lord. And now here comes the Lord reaping where John has sowed. Here comes Jesus' disciples reaping where John and his disciples have sowed. you got to remember this whole thing comes hot on the heels of the end of John 3 and the beginning of John 4 where there was that contention between Jesus' disciples and John's disciples and they tried to bait the Lord into acting haughty or they tried to bait John and his disciples into acting uh, snobbish about their work that Jesus seemingly is infringing on. That's not how it is. Verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. I'm sure she had some different words there as well, but that's the summary of it. That's just a quick reminder. You have all these people coming from Samaria to see Jesus, and they're coming based on the testimony of this single person, this person who spoke with such um, fervor and with such honesty and with such, with such um, zeal, with such obvious conviction that they couldn't help at the very least but just inquire. But they had... To a, certain, to a certain extent, already believed based solely on her testimony. Now, imagine how it's going to be. How much more they'll get when they hear not someone else's testimony, but the Lord himself. Verse 40. So when the Samaritans were come to the Lord, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Look how readily these people are to invite the Lord to stay with them. Knowing he's a Jew. Unlike this woman, this is their first encounter with him. They haven't had a chance to talk and to, to kind of figure out how different and unusual he is, like the woman and Jesus did when they first started conversing. And Jesus said things that were not very Judeocentric. And now here, they come to Jesus, and they are so intrigued by him, regardless of his ethnicity, regardless of his nationality, regardless of past prejudices that they were the, uh, the victims of, they say, stay with us. Two days or more if you'll let it, but you know, Jesus says two days and he's out. But it's so opposite of these people who the Jews make it their mission to go a very long way around to avoid 
They will take days out of their travel to go around Samaria. And the Samaritans, when they have a chance to see Jesus, they want him to stay days with them. Now, contrast that with the Jews themselves and how they responded to Jesus, especially those in Judea. That not, it's not universal, but by and large, at best, Jesus was a curiosity. And at worst, they were trying to kill him, like from the jump. But the Samaritans, we want to hear more. We believe. Stay with us. And these are the people that the rest of the Jews are saying, don't talk to them. Stay away from them. Look at the fertile ground. Verse 41. And many more believe because of his own word. So you had a couple of verses ago. They heard the, the testimony of this woman and some believed. They all come to inquire and many more believe because of his word. Let that be a reminder to you as personal evangelists. The Lord has done great things to you. The Lord has done great things through you. You have a testimony to share. But do not make your testimony the central thesis of your evangelism. You and your story can only go so far. All you can do is tell someone what the Lord has done for you if you're just talking about you. And that's it. There is a repository of things the Lord has done to people all over the world from the beginning of human history that you have access in your fingertips. Use that as the central thesis of your evangelism and let your own personal testimony just be gravy on the mashed potatoes. The meat and the potatoes of your, your evangelism needs to be the Lord's words and his actions and his deeds. So yes, this woman had a testimony and she, she, um, she started something there, but it was Jesus and his words that sparked everything else that happened here in the city of the Samaritans. 42. Matthew. Yes, Jim. Uh, I've got a question on verse 39 and verse 41. It says... Uh, Sorry, how long has your hand been up? I didn't notice. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there, it talks about uh, many in the city believed, and then in uh, 41, many more believed. Right. What What's the action involved here? I, I mean, what does believe mean in the context of this verse? I think... Uh, and. I think we'll see another usage of it to a slightly different extent, but close enough. And when we get to later in this chapter, we start talking about the nobleman who has a son and he believes. And then when he finds out his son is healed, he believes again. We see, we see that, that same word happen twice. So it'll be similar then too. But I think what you're seeing here is this woman is given a testimony and they're taking her at her word. They are believing her testimony. She says, I have found the Messiah. She doesn't flat out say that. What she says is, is this not the Messiah? Could this not be the Messiah? She leaves it open-ended, but it's, it's almost a rhetorical question. So she basically says, I met this guy who told me all that I ever did. He said all these amazing things. He's clearly a prophet. Could this not be the Messiah? And they believe, the first time you hear the word, they believe that she has found somebody who may be the Messiah. Then they come back and they listen to Jesus himself. And now they believe who Jesus says he is, the Messiah. So if you're asking me the definition of the word, it's just what it always is, especially in the book of John. It is to um, commit oneself to someone or something. In this case, they are committing themselves to the truth that Jesus is the Messiah based on her testimony and then, to a greater extent, his own. I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> well, go ahead and elaborate on yourself. It talks about, and many more believe, you know, uh, with the missionary efforts and so forth, but Jesus and his, uh, his disciples were baptized. And so it's not, it's not the same as you would see in Acts when people believed you know, that was an action taken. Acts. Yeah, yeah. You don't have record um, in Samaria of them submitting to baptism like you have with John the Baptist and his work, or Jesus and his disciples baptizing. That's the beginning of this chapter. Um, that was going on, but you don't have record of it here. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just it's not told us here. Um, we, uh, that's open ended. I don't know that, but um, yes, that's true. All all we have is just like let's call it for lack of a better the first step. They, we see them taking that initial plunge into what could lead to a life of discipleship. How deep they go into that, you know, that's just, we don't, we're not told that, but we see at least their, their willingness to take that step, their willingness to believe um, and to continue believing, which again, to contrast with many of the Jews of Judea, especially, it's just, it's not there. They were just not that open to that. And I think the reason why is because the, the Jews of Judea were so uh, regimented and traditionally minded and whereas Samaria, you know, it's an open book, uh, or it's a, it's, a, it's a blank slate, I should say. It's easy for Jesus to imprint himself on them, whereas in Judea, he's, he's pushing, he's pushing against the tide of tradition. Um, did we do verse 42? No, let's do verse 42. 
So they say to the woman, now we believe, not because of your saying, but we have heard him ourselves. In other words, our belief now is not rooted just on secondhand testimony, but firsthand, talking to the man himself. We have heard him ourselves and know that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the, what's it say? Not the Savior of the Jews. Though I would remind you, last week, earlier in the conversation with Jesus and the woman, Jesus flat out tells the woman, you worship what you don't know. We know that salvation is of the Jews. But having talked with the Messiah, the conversation they had with him were not given. But they came to understand that he is the Christ and that his mission involves salvation more than just to his people, but rather salvation for the world. You would not find language like that in Judea. They waited for their Messiah to be the Savior of Judea. They waited for the King of Israel. They waited for the kingdom to be restored in Jerusalem. Whereas here, the Samaritans, they don't have that baggage. They don't have that historical bias, that slant of rabbinical teaching telling them you're all special. The Messiah is going to treat you special and, you know, pamper your bottoms and powder your bottoms and give you, you know, gold-plated, you know, dinner, dinner servings and things. No, no, they didn't have any of that. They didn't have any of that. They just had the prophecy of Moses that the Savior will come. And them not being of the Jewish persuasion, look at it as a Savior for them too, thus the world. Two days he stayed with them, verse 43. And then continued on heading north into Galilee. Why? Well, verse 44, Jesus himself testified, A prophet has no honor in his own country. That's not Nazareth. That's Judah, or Judea, I should say. That's Judea, the southern province. Um, he's already been there, and he meant nothing but hostility and resistance. Now, that's maybe too big of a blanket. He, obviously, there were people who lived in that region who became uh, vehement disciples. You'll have Lazarus and Mary and Martha and people who are in that region. You have people that he will heal who will devote themselves entirely to him. But in terms of the rank and file, in terms of the leadership especially, it was hostility. It was, it was a disbelief. It was um, out, outright uh, rejection. So Jesus recognized that truism, which is a prophet is not welcome in his own country. He tends to have more success away. Why? Because you can, uh, what's the saying that we have today? You can't go home again. Right, you you grow up somewhere, or you're you're entrenched somewhere, or there's somewhere that's just a part of your culture, and you share that same culture, and then you try to be this person who's telling your own people that they're wrong and that they're doing wrong. There's a sense of resentment that comes with that. Who are you to tell us that kind of thing? So, Jesus finds more success in the north. He spends a lot of his ministry up here, and this is where he goes. Verse 45. He comes into Galilee, and the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. Mind you. <laughs> He, he's, he realizes he's has, he has less success in Judea, so he goes up north to people who saw what he did in Judea. But they're from up there, so they don't carry that baggage that comes with living down there. They don't have that kind of, um, not, not pride, I guess it's like pride. They don't, they don't have that kind of uh, sense of superiority that comes with, well, we're the people of Judah. We are the people of old Judah. We're the people of Judea. You, you up there in the north, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That whole kind of regional bias idea. They had, they just came down in, a, in, in direction, north in elevation, but they came down to Passover, which is what was John 2, and they saw Jesus driving at the money changers, and they heard Jesus giving his speeches, they saw miracles that he did, and then they came back home and told everybody, they saw excitedly about the Messiah, or at least a possible Messiah, and now Jesus has come back to them. And they remember what he did down there, and they're up here without any of the baggage that's belonging down there. So they, he came into Galilee, and those people received him, because they saw all that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, Passover. For they were also at the feast. 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. That's the first miracle that John records. That's the first miracle that is presumed he did in all of his ministry. Um, but it's the first one that we have in the book of John, for sure, in particular. We're about to get the second. That was John 2, or the end of John 4. In between was just a bunch of speeches and conversations and things. Is that a lawnmower? Verse 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain, my Bible says, nobleman. Does anybody have a different translation there? Royal official. Royal official. Sovereign person is just all it means. So not a Jew, probably a Roman, um, not a soldier, or he'd be called that, or a centurion or something like that. So just some kind of a, of a government person, but not so high up that he has some specific title. He just, he just is some haughty toddy hoity-toity kind of person whose son was sick at Capernaum. 
when he heard that Jesus would come out of Judea, in Judea into Galilee, he went to him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, we are going to make certain assumptions. They're not going to be baseless. They're not going to be um, evil surmising. We're not assuming the worst in people without evidence. But throughout this, this account here, toward the end of John 4, we're going to make some assumptions. Jesus is not going to make assumptions. It's very important that we remember that distinction. We cannot read minds. We cannot know the thoughts and intents of someone's heart. But God in the flesh can read you like a book. He knows, no matter how sincere you may seem, no matter how much a part of you may be sincere, he knows that other part of you that might be a hypocrite. He knows that ulterior motive you might have and whatever you're asking for or requesting or whatever. So Jesus is going to make certain statements, but they're not assumptions. But throughout this, we necessarily must make assumptions because all we're given is just what we have in the text. So we have to read between the lines. We have to examine bigger picture context. We have to kind of remember these are real people making real statements. So what kind of inflection is he using? What kind of body language does he have? To try to figure out what's his angle, what's his deal, that kind of thing. Okay? So what we know about this person just by assumption, he's heard about, well, not just some, by inference, he's heard about Jesus. He's heard he's a miracle man. Because when he hears that Jesus is in town, Jesus is so noteworthy that he's heard this guy is around, which he's not in the same town as him. He's in Capernaum and Jesus is in Cana, okay? But he's close enough that Jesus' fame has reached him. And he knows he's a miracle man because he seeks for him to heal his son. So he knows some things about Jesus and the power that he has already demonstrated in this region. All we have in the book of John is turning water to wine, which didn't heal anybody. Jesus has done other miracles that John has not recorded. For that, I would direct you to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But he's done them. This guy has heard about them, and now he goes to inquire about his son. Okay? 48. He goes and he says, Save my son or he's going to die. Verse 48. Then Jesus says to him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now that sounds like a heartless statement. It's not. It sounds like it. It sounds very careless. It sounds like Jesus doesn't care about this guy's son. It sounds like that. He hears this guy say, my son's going to die. He's not asking for himself. He's asking for his son. A child, by assumption. So he's not asking for you know, a new car. He's not asking for his own personal health. He's not asking for anything that you could construe just by his request as selfish at all. He sees his son is dying. Clearly, he's tried everything else. And so he goes to the miracle man as his last resort. Now, who among us would not do that? Right? Obviously, prayer should be your first resort, but it isn't always. And so to our discredit, we make prayer a second resort. Or sometimes we don't. And to our supreme discredit, we'll make prayer a third, fourth, or last resort. But eventually, we'll get to prayer. Fine. Even if it's your last resort, pray. You should have prayed first, but at least you're praying. Pray. Okay, good. Pray. And you have a sick relative that you love and that you want to be healed. And you've tried everything else. So you go to the God who can do the impossible. Here is this beautiful three-year window when you can do that as effortlessly and as casually as I'm talking to you right now. Like he's not, he's not putting his hands together and bowing his head and he's not weeping into his pillow at three o'clock in the morning. He's talking to a guy who happens to be God in the form of a guy. So he has this special, unique opportunity to do what we all do anytime we have a sick relative, right? Ask him to heal our sick relative. But what if we ask God to heal our sick relative and God said, you just want to see a wonder. You just want to see a sign or you won't believe me. Would we not think if God ever responded that way to us, do you not care that my son is dying? But there is more going on here than that. Because if all that I've said, and if you've thought that, if you've read that, and you've thought, that, that just sounded right. Why would Jesus say that? What you're, what's happening right there, what we're doing when we do that, is we are assuming that Jesus is assuming. We are assuming that Jesus is just assuming this guy wants to see a dog and pony show. We are assuming that Jesus is assuming that this guy is like the Pharisees in Jerusalem who, as we'll see, repeatedly will demand miracle after miracle after miracle and see many miracles and refuse to believe and keep demanding more. 
we assume that Jesus is assuming that this guy wants to see a miracle. But Jesus does not make assumptions. Jesus knows this guy wants to see a miracle. It doesn't change the fact that he has a sick son. He does. It doesn't change the fact that he does want his son to be healed. He does. It doesn't change the fact that he is asking God sincerely to heal his son. He is. But there is another part of him that wants to see if this miracle man I've heard so much about really is a miracle man. So I'll kill two birds with one stone, and I will ask him to heal my son. And if he does, great, my son is healed, and I've confirmed that what I've heard is true. Now, you might think that's very crass of a person to use his son in that way. And I would remind you of two things. One, he's a Roman. They don't have much morals anyway. But number two, his son is dying anyway. And he's tried everything else, one would assume. So why not toss him out there as a, as a, as a tell to see if the Lord really is what he says he is? There's that side of it that's there. I know that's true because Jesus stated it. Jesus doesn't make assumptions. He read his mind. And he said, there's a part of you. There's a big part of you that wants me to heal your son. There's a part of you that just wants to see it happen so that you can see whether or not I am what I say I am. He says that, verse 49, and the nobleman says, sir, come down or my son will die. That does not give me a lot. That's just what the Holy Spirit told John to record. Maybe that's all he said. That's the quote. That's all I have to go on. I don't have body language. I don't have, you know, were there tears welling in his eyes? I don't have, does he have like, is he blushing because he's been called out and exposed for his, his hypocrisy? Did he not know he was a hypocrite until the Lord confronted him with it and then he had to admit to himself? All that could be happening and it's not told to us. All we're told is just, he repeats the request. I'm begging you, my son's going to die. So I will make an assumption for the good that this person has had his hypocrisy exposed has now set that aside and he said, I don't want this to be about me anymore. Just make it about my son. I need you because no one else can help. My son's going to die. He makes the request and Jesus says, go back home. Go your way. Your son lives. Jesus says, your son lives. What's the opposite of lives? Dies. Dies. <clears throat> yeah. Not died. That'd be the opposite of lived. The opposite of lives is dies. Your son is living. In fact, that's the better translation. Go your way. Your son is living. What was he when he got to Jesus? What was his son when the man got to Jesus? His son was dying. His son was headed down. Now Jesus says, go back home. Your son is living. He's not dying anymore. He's healed. But he doesn't say healed. He says he's living. I just like that. The meaning thing, I just like that. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. Now, in just a second, I mean, it's going to be longer for him, but for us, just a second. He's going to get home, and he's going to inquire about his son. He's going to find out his son is healed. He's, before he even rejoices, he's going to ask for the deets. I want the specifics. I want the details. Tell me, when exactly was he healed? So that he can cross-reference that with the moment that he was talking to Jesus to see, is this just a giant coincidence, and that he was healed, like, before I ever met Jesus? And they'll, he'll find out, just to spoil it, that he was healed when Jesus said, at that same hour, when Jesus said, your son lives, that's when he started to mend and turn for the better. And he'll say in just a minute, when he heard that, he believed. So which is it? Is he believing when he sees later when he gets home, or is he believing here? There's two kinds of beliefs. There is the belief in which, in which you put your trust in someone or something to do something in the future. That is, that is hopeful belief. That is a belief of expectation. In fact, you could translate, although it's too clunkily, you should never do that, but the literal meaning of the word pistuo translates belief, joyful trust conjoined with obedience. Trust is a forward-looking thing. It's, it's, it's often um, you know, rooted and grounded in things that have happened in the past. God has been reliable, so I will trust he will be reliable in the future that I can't see, but he can. But it still is a future-looking thing. So he says to the man, go your way, your son lives. And the man trusts, looking forward, that that is true. He does not walk away from Jesus saying, well, he didn't, he's supposed to come with me and do the thing. He's supposed to come with me and then do some big light show so that I can see that he is the Messiah and get my son healed. 
He doesn't do that. He's not interested in that anymore. Jesus called him out for that. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. He didn't see a sign or a wonder. Yet the Holy Spirit says he believed. So I will assume the good in this person. That having been rebuked by his Lord, he shed that part of his personality. He stopped making it about him. And he started putting his sole interest in the welfare of his son. In which case, when Jesus said your son lives, he believed that was true. Without any sense of, but I didn't get to see it happen, so I don't believe. So I don't know yet that you're really the Messiah. I believe you. And believing him, his trust looking forward, trust, he goes on. Verse 51. And as he was now going down in elevation, his servants met him and they told him, saying, Your son lives. Your son is mending. Your son is getting better. Your son is not dying anymore. And then he inquired of them the hour when he began to mend, which is not itself a sign of disbelief. It's simply asking for information, which we would all do. When did my son begin to mend? And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew it was at that same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And himself believed. That statement is not saying that was the hour. Like you can mistranslate this or you can misinterpret it. Oh no, what it's saying in verse 53, someone might say is, uh, he, when they said it was the seventh hour, that's when he knew, that's when I talked to Jesus, and that's when I um, believed. No, no, that's not what it says. It says, when did my son heal? It was yesterday at the seventh hour. That's when I was talking to Jesus, and when he heard that, then again a second time, verse 4, 53, he believed and all his house who weren't with him to believe the first time. Now they're believing the first time, and he's believing the second time. Because this second belief for him is not a future-looking thing. It's a backward-looking thing. It's, it's a trust in the one who has done. Has God ever done anything good for somebody in this room? In a, in a, not in an abstract way. Like, he saved us, but give me something. Like, has anybody been sick, and you prayed, and you've been healed? Has anyone had a sick loved one, and you prayed, and they've been healed? It doesn't always happen. Sometimes the, sometimes the boy dies. But it does happen when someone gets healed. Has anybody ever been sick and then prayed and gotten better? No. Don't be shy. Has it happened? Okay. You look back on that. So that the next time you're sick, you will believe that he will again. You look back on that and it reinforces your belief. It strengthens your belief. It, it solidifies your belief. It makes it stronger. Because you look back on what he has done, looking forward to what he will do. Because you don't know the future. You don't know. But you have seen. You know that. And you know he was with you then. So why wouldn't he be with you now? Because he's the same God who doesn't change. So he trusted before looking forward. And now he trusted looking back. This is, this is a faith that takes root. Incidentally, still without seeing. He never saw the miracle happen. He just believed. Verse 54. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did. That's... Second recorded in John. He's done many in between, which has already been alluded to, but second that John is recorded of the seven he records. This is the second miracle that he did when he was coming of Judea into Galilee. Where did this miracle take place? Where did the first miracle take place? Water to one. Where did that one happen at? Cana. Cana. Where was Jesus when he talked to the nobleman's father? The, the, the nobleman's son's father. The, the nobleman. Where was he? Cana. Where was the nobleman's son healed? Capernaum. So where did the miracle take place? Did it take place in Cana or Capernaum? The answer is yes. Because when you throw a dart at a dartboard, there it is. When you throw a dart at a dartboard, the, the impressive nature of it is that the, the space in between here and there. Like you can just take a dart and you stab it in the dartboard, but that's not impressive. Anybody can do that. But when you're way over here and you throw it and you hit it, the impressive part is the space in between here and there. So the miracle is the whole thing from Capernaum to from Cana to Capernaum. The fact that he was able to do this thing from here to there is itself the miracle. The healing is also part of it. But it's like, where did this miracle take place? Did it take place in, uh, in um, Cana where he spoke it or Capernaum where it was done? It's, it's the whole spread of those two areas. That's just It's just one big fat miracle from here to there. All right? We still have time. John 5. John 5. John 5 takes place after John 6. <sighs> the chronology of John is just, ah, it's optional. So you have John 1, John 2, John 3, John 4. All that happens in pretty succinct succession, pretty, pretty clear chronological succession. Jesus starts his ministry, grabs a couple of disciples, heads off to Jerusalem for Passover in John 2. Um, 
upsets the apple cart, upsets the money changers table, uh, talks to Nicodemus in chapter 3, in the right after Matthew Passover, leaves Jerusalem once there's some bickering amongst the Pharisees between John and Jesus' disciples, heads to Samaria, talks to her, heads to uh, Galilee, heals an nobleman's son. Boom, 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 boom. Bang, 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 all in succession. Then you have the opening of John 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, which is Passover again. But in between uh, uh, 4 and 5 is chapter 6, where Jesus is still in Galilee, because at the end of chapter 5, he's going to be in Jerusalem. And then you open chapter 6, bang, he's back up in Galilee again. What's, what's the deal? Well, the deal is you gotta you got to switch around those two chapters. Because he's in Galilee when he heals an old man's son, stays in Galilee, talks to a bunch of people, feeds 5,000, walks on water, crosses the Red Sea, is on the other side of the water. A bunch of people leave him because he says, you have to eat my body and drink my blood. The disciples are all that's left. And then he spends a year teaching and preaching and healing. And then he heads back down to Jerusalem for Passover again, year number 2, John chapter 5. Okay? It's just easier to follow these in book order, not chronological order, because now I have to do that just two more times, and otherwise I'll be doing it every week. All right, 5 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, up in elevation, down on the map. He went up to Jerusalem. Verse 2. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five, my Bible says, porches. Did your Bible have a different translation there? Porticos. Porticos. That's just that's an older word, so porch is probably easier. But it has five congregating spaces, five usually shaded areas where people can gather and do whatever they're going to do. Uh, sometimes talk, sometimes teach and preach, sometimes um, you know say the end is nigh. Those kind of people who are around back then too. Or in this case, it's where a bunch of people who are sick and and are ill or are um, suffering from some kind of malady. They can't walk. They can't use their extremities. They can't see, etc. They go there, not to pray on, that's too negative, but they go there um, with the expectation that when people come to Jerusalem for the feast days, whether it's Passover or Pentecost or Sukkoth or Hanukkah, when they come into town, or Yom Kippur, when they come into town, they're going to have a charitable mindset. You know, However charitable people are, there's like a 150% increase in the Christmas season. Um, because it's that time of year when people just are naturally inclined to kind of peer pressure into being more charitable. So these people congregate in areas where pastors and comers are, are being charitable spiritually, that they might toss them a quarter and help them out too. Verse 2, again, is that Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porticos or porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, my Bible says, having maladies, having uh, things that make them unwhole. They, they, are, they are not um, completely healthy. Some are blind, some are halt, my Bible says, limping or lame. Some are withered, so they have some kind of a, um, a paralysis that causes their hands sometimes to shrivel or they can't walk, things like that. And they're, they're all gathered together near this pool in, in, um, called Bethesda, waiting for the moving of the water, my Bible says, for the stirring of the water, your Bible might say, for the bubbling up of the water, you might translate it. So they're all, they're all waiting anxiously for something to happen with this water. What's the deal? With the water. Verse 4, you get some commentary. For an angel, this is just what my Bible says, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whoever then was first after the troubling of the water and who stepped in was made whole of whatever disease that he had. Does anybody have verse 4 in brackets or some kind of a, a notation from the um, yes. printer? Yes. What is, did you have like a little note about that? What does it say? Something like, this is not found in the oldest manuscripts. Uh, it was made well. Oh, you just have a little note explained. Yeah. But do you, do you have the, the text of verse four? <clears throat> do you have it in your Bible? Is it is it is it in any way set apart or distinguished? Is it put in brackets or anything like that? It's just a little bracket there. It's just put in brackets. What translation is that? New American Standard. That's what I was gonna guess. Mine has the whole thing down here in the. What is it? Does it say something yeah. or is it? Just... No, it says waiting for the moving of the water because an angel would go down into the pool from time to time and stir up the water. Then the first one. Who got in after the water was stirred up, recovered from whatever ailment he had. And is that set apart and mm -hmm. just, yeah. yeah. So I don't want to get, this is way inside baseball, and I do not want to go down this road because there's five minutes left and I don't want to do that. The bell's about to ring and I'm going to get mad. So <laughs> there, there's a lot of uh, translation and, and ah, there it is. There's a lot of manuscript and, and codex uh, analyses that goes into uh, the arrangement and the order and the placement of the text of your Bible and sometimes the statements themselves. And there's like a 0 .01 
you know, variants in various codexes. And you have another thing that happens in like 1 John 5 and things like that. They're very minor and they don't do any damage to your, your faith in God or your trust in the, in the creator or things like that. But you have these little variants here that, that makes people go, huh, what's that about? So this is just one of them. And setting all that aside, I think my simplest way to break this down is what you have here is John the writer simply telling you, here's what people thought about this pool. And it comes across, by the way, based on the way it's printed and translated, it comes across as this is understood fact. But I think it is more accurate, I think it is more fair to say that this is not what's actually happening, this is what people thought it was. For a couple of reasons. For one, if this really was magic water, okay, A, that is completely out of sorts with the entire rest of the Bible, with the way that God does miracles, and the way that God does healing. Nowhere else but here. If this is literally what it is, and there's no, no, no other explanation for it, no other else uh, anywhere else in the Bible, when God is going to do a healing miracle, does he set it up passively, where he just establishes this system where uh, every now and then I'm going to stir this water like it's a Kool-Aid jar, and then the first one in gets to win. The first one in, and no one else, because that's, that's established. That's the precedent here, because you, you're going to meet this guy who can't walk, and he can't get healed, he thinks, because he can't get in the water in time. Someone else always gets in there first. Nowhere else ever when God heals people or persons, period, singular or plural, does he ever set it up where it's first come, no one else gets served. That's, that's never how it works. It's always a universal thing. Anyone who wants to come to God can get healed. Best example of that is when Moses put the seraph on the staff in Numbers, after God had struck the, the people with a disease for their continuous blasphemy, and as they were dying and they were pleading for mercy, God says, all right, Moses, put the seraph on the staff. Anyone who looks at it will live. So that's it. That's all you have to do. It's not specific or dependent on your condition or your situation. It's not like first one to look at it lives and the rest of you have to die and go. No, it's not like that. God doesn't work like that. It's always a universal thing. It's universal in the sense that anybody can, but anybody who will has to be the one who willingly goes to God. This is set up where if you're not the fastest guy, you don't get anything. And that just doesn't jibe with the way God does business. Second, it's so weird, and I use that as an argument. An angel, it's not God, it's, it's an angel comes down and stirs it. And there is so much mythology, even in ancient times, certainly today too, but in ancient times, based around angels and demons that has no basis in spiritual or scriptural reality. For example, on a bigger scale, anytime there's storms on seas, in ancient days people believed that was demons messing with the water and anytime there was calm waters it was angels like hands across america in the waters to keep it calm and there's just there's no basis for that there's no scriptural basis for that it's just weather but people ascribe things they don't understand to a lot of times spiritual things or by spiritual i mean non non physical things uh, and and those things you know spiritual names and things get roped into that like angels and things like that so my interpretation my best way of understanding verse four here is just this is what people thought and when Jesus talks to this guy, he makes no reference to the stirring of the water. He makes no reference to it at all. He just sees a guy who can't walk. And he says, would you like to be healed? The guy's going to say to Jesus, I can't be healed because I can't get in the water fast enough. And Jesus doesn't acknowledge that. He blows right by that. And he just heals the guy without having anything to do with the water. It's just so much about it. It just, it just reeks of superstition. So I ascribe it to that by Occam's razor. All right. Verse 5. A certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. So not from birth. If it was from birth, it'd say from birth. Like they did in John 9, the blind guy from birth. So this guy has been unable to walk for a long time. And Jesus saw him lying there, which also implies Jesus went to where the people were who were injured. Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had now been a long time in that case, just lying there unable to be cared for. And he says to him, will you be made whole? They did not have... Um, social programs. They didn't have welfare. They didn't have disability you know, laws. If you could not work, you did not eat. And you were reliant entirely on the charity of others, which is why, again, they congregated in places like this, hoping to um, incite the charity of their fellow Jews as they're doing their spiritual business. Well, we'll pick it up in verse 7. That's okay. It's a good place to stop. He's about to heal the guy, and then the huge fallout that happens, which is just equal pause, frustrating and hilarious. We'll pick it up in John 5, verse 7 next week. Thanks, y'all.